This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week's episode is brought to you by the Friends of the Magic Word. It's because of their financial pledges and donations that we were able to keep this podcast going week after week. And this week, we want to welcome a new friend of the Magic Word, Mr. Timothy Hahn. Thank you, Tim, very much for your monthly pledge. That means so much to us right now as ever. And I appreciate your support financially as well as those from all of the other friends who continue to support us with their help as well. And I thank you listeners for tuning in each week and listening and supporting this podcast and by helping us by giving us five-star reviews on the iTunes store and elsewhere, wherever that you can review podcasts. And I thank you very much, listeners, for your support in helping to spread the word, that is the magic word, by telling all of your friends at the club meetings or conventions or wherever that you congregate and get an opportunity to share some time with other magicians. Be sure and tell them about how much you enjoy the magic word and they should be listening too. That would be a great way of helping to support us as well. Well, this week we're going to be having a great guest who is an author and has also offered us an opportunity to win a couple of her books that she's going to be giving. We're going to be giving away actually in this contest. We'll give you more information on the back end of this episode after you've heard what she has to say about her person that she had traveled with for a number of years and is also well known in our community as being one of the legendary street magicians, Cellini. Jim Cellini was well known and uh, loved and respected by magicians for his skills and had traveled around not just the U.S., but then around the world and performing at busking festivals and every place else. But it, primarily it seemed like it was in New Orleans and New York and out in San Francisco and elsewhere. And along the way, at uh, early on from the very beginning, is when that he had met up with Eileen McFalls. And Eileen is the guest this week who is going to tell us about some of those memoirs that she had written. And it's a travel log, basically, of being with Jim Cellini uh, as he had traveled around the world and as his skills uh, developed and also some of the people who they interacted with, who were other performers. And it was just uh, an amazing time back in the early 19th. 1980s. And so she has, uh, again, just a unique, different perspective. And so when you want to hear some stories uh, about what it's like being on the streets, this book really tells a lot about it. I really don't like to necessarily promote a book uh, or someone's set of lecture notes if it's just going to be teaching us some new tricks or something. But if there is something that's unique and going to be driving us forward and giving us a perspective or giving us some information about history that we can appreciate uh, as magicians so that we can grow and learn from that, then I like to highlight that. And that's why that I'm having Eileen on this week as my guest, who will be telling us again uh, a little bit about her book and also a few stories from the book then as well. So please welcome my guest this week, Ms. Eileen McFalls, here on The Magic Word. Right now I have with me the author of a uh, most delightful book. It is called No Ordinary Magic, which the subtitle is Unexpected Travels with the Great Cellini. And indeed, that's, uh, the Cellini was a great street performer. And for those of you who got an opportunity to see him, he was fantastic and noted best for his linking rings. He had studied under Slidini, and he had traveled the world. And by his side, he had someone who had accompanied him and had figured out how to not only help him, but also do her own street magic uh, kind of as well. And she wrote this fantastic book. Please welcome my guest, Eileen McFalls. How are you doing, Eileen? Good. Thank you for having me, Scott. You're welcome. Thanks very much for being my guest, and I'm really was excited about this when you had sent me the email to begin with saying that I've come out with this book, that before I finish the second sentence, I wanted to get back with you and said, yeah, I think this is something that our listeners would like to read, because I know the interest that magicians have in Cellini, whereas that most people who kind of pass by a street performer, they um, have different feelings about how that they look on someone, whether they have respect for them or not, of whether 
whether they're a homeless street person or something. And you must have had some of those uh, kinds of uh, feelings as well whenever you've traveled with Jim Cellini. So, golly, I, I, let me just ask that as an opening question over here. What okay. was that like whenever that you were traveling with him uh, as far as how that he was being treated? And did you feel that he got respect that he needed or not or what? You know, it's funny because that depend uh, on where we were. Mm-hmm. Uh, the best place of all that we bust actually was New York City because there were so many places and so many corners we could work and plazas. And the police never, ever bothered us. And that was my actual first introduction in learning how to street perform because I didn't know anything at all. And I was not a performer. Mm-hmm. And when I met Jim uh, in the French Quarter on Jackson Square, I was just in awe of what he did because I had never seen any kind of magic like that in my life. Now, you'd gone to college. Isn't that right? Didn't, I know? did. Yeah. I got mm-hmm. a degree in biology, and I was working at a hospital in the pathology lab, you know, doing chemistry and blood bank and hematology. There in New Orleans? Yes, in mm-hmm. New Orleans. And... Um, I had just decided to take a day off. I don't know what struck me. Uh, you know, I, things were happening in my life, and I was trying to figure it out, and I was not in the best place. Yeah. In your and 20s, I'm guessing, 26, I, 7? I was 25 years old. 25. Hmm. And uh, so I took the streetcar and went uh, to the French Quarter. But on the streetcar, I actually saw Jim come up through the car, put his money in the slot, And he slipped into the seat in front of me. And sitting in the seat there was a lady who had Down syndrome. And I looked at this guy and he looked really weird. You know, he had on this uh, uh, shiny uh, vest. He had uh, knee-high boots. He had earrings in his ears. He had tattoos on his arms. Mm -hmm. I was thinking... Who is this guy? And at first I thought maybe he was an actor, you know, that he was in one of the films that, you know, but he was so nice to this lady with Down syndrome and he was just talking with her and chatting with her and and she just loved having him sit next to her. And so we disembarked at Canal and I lost sight of him. And I just wandered through, you know, Bourbon Street and Royal Street looking at, you know, in the shops. And then I went to Jackson Square and I sat at the Cafe Pontava right on Jackson Square. And I saw this guy stride across the square and it was Jim. And when he unfolded his table and started doing some magic and a few people were surrounding his table and I went over there you know, and started watching, and then all of a sudden, a big crowd formed, and when he did the cups and balls, you know, of course, first, I was really mesmerized by Mm -hmm. the beauty of his hands when he was doing vanishing and reappearing silver dollars, and he was doing cigarette routines, and I had never seen anything like this in my entire life, but when he did the cups and balls, it just totally blew me away and everybody else in the audience as well, you know, and of course everybody questioned where did, you know, you know, first they said, Oh, those were lemons. No, they were oranges. No, they were, this. <laughs> they were that. You know? Right. So we just, we, you know, hit it off instantly. And, um, and then he just asked me, he said, do you want to go travel? And I said, Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I quit my job. <laughs> wow, wow! And just uh, it hit the road, and then stayed with him for for a long time. And we'll get into that then also. Yeah, I was picturing that as you were read, or as I was reading the book, uh, of you going. I was thinking it was the Cafe du Monde that you had set across, because I can imagine sitting there in Jackson Square looking across. I've seen street magicians right there on that corner. What was the name of the restaurant again? You said where you were. The Cafe Pontalba, it's right on Jackson Square. It's a caddy corner to St. Louis Cathedral. Okay, so that's just like a couple doors down from Demon? Uh, no, it's literally on Jackson Square. Uh, oh. Cafe Pontalba is actually where uh, Decatur is. Yes, now I'm with you. Okay. Right, and Jackson Square is where um, uh, Charters and St. Peter converge. Mm-hmm. And then you have the historical uh, Cabildo and right. the 
tear right there. Yeah. It seems that New Orleans has always been kind of a mecca for street performers. I, I would let me just say that, and uh, also uh, Venice Beach has been another one, and then down in um, uh, Key West in yes. in the in the Keys seem to be in the United States three popular places that street performers like to perform, just like in Covent Gardens, I guess, in the UK. Uh, yeah. So there are uh, certain places like that. And what I found interesting is then the book where that you had gone kind of traveling around the country and then later around the world, but uh, also went up into New York. So whenever that it was uh, in the warmer season, you come down to New Orleans. And then when it was uh, or rather, I guess, during warmer times, you were up in New York. And then when it's cold, you'd come down then to, to New Orleans. So working on the streets of New York, that is not where I think would be the best place for street performers. Did you find or he find that being a more difficult place to work as far as uh, was income easier, better, harder, worse? Uh, both. Hmm. It was a fantastic place because when we got together, Jim was basically had only been on the streets for a couple of years. When you first met him? Right, when I mm -hmm. first met him, and he actually had stayed out in Boulder working the Pearl Street Mall and then the 16th on in Denver. And that's not the same as a place like New York City. Uh, so he really learned to hone his act by doing his act so many times a day, and that was uh, available in New York. We would get in there at 9 o'clock in the morning, have breakfast at the Olympic Diner uh, up on the 8th Avenue, mm -hmm. then literally take the last city bus from 42nd Street, Port Authority, at 1 o'clock in the morning, and go back to Parsippany, New Jersey, which took about 30 minutes. And we had our uh, living quarters at a campground there. Mm -hmm. we, we lived in a step van and then traded that for a school bus. So we were basically outside pretty much 14, 15, 16 hours a day in New York City. And it was a tough place, but it was a great learning experience. I certainly think that it would be, and I know that uh, initially you were just kind of a bystander, and one of the people, as I was reading the book, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I felt like that you were just one of the people, but it's like, I want to be involved, I'm with you, I'm, and so what can I do? And then you started doing some things to help bring in the crowd, and then later started doing your own Wonder Mouse pitches, which I thought was kind of uh, fun and interesting. I had one of those Wonder Mice whenever I was young. I saw some street performer, and I, I got one of those kind of things and kind of played with it then as well. So uh, I, I'm surprised you actually didn't then branch out and start doing a Sven Gali deck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned I learned the mouse pitch, but first when, when Jim was trying to incorporate me into his show, the first thing he said, he said, memorize my opening pitch. And he said, when we're in places like in front of Schubert Alley or if we're in, uh, you know, in front of the Central Library or large areas, he mm -hmm. said, you can do the opening pitch. And so I memorized it, you know, and and he told me how to pause and, you know, how to emphasize words and things like that. So my first time that I did that in front of the Central Library on uh, Fifth Avenue, New York Public Library, um, people were so taken aback by my southern accent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that They just stood there stupefied, and then they turned around and walked away. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and Jim looked at me, and he said, well, me guess you can't do that anymore <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of uh, wasn't going to work we had to go a different direction <laughs> we had to go a different direction and so since he had spent quite a bit of time in his younger days uh singing in bands you know mm -hmm. he had uh show bands where he actually did magic yep he sang he did the tambourine he showed me how to do all the moves with the tambourine, you know, the shakes and the shimmies and the tossing in the air. And also he made these uh, ribbons for me. They were long ribbons that he weighted down with pennies. So it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever seen that flag tossing that they do in Italy. Oh, you know? sure. Yes. Yeah. So basically you take these ribbons and you do kind of like a dance with them. 
And I thought it was the cheesiest thing in the world <laughs> for me <laughs> to do. And he said, no, no. And so I did the tambourine. I'd shake and gather crowd, and I would twirl these ribbons. And people would come up and say, oh, that's just so lovely. And I was just so embarrassed because I thought it was just so cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was working. That's one of the things I think that is hard for a street performer, of course, is to get a, a crowd. And once you get that tip, then you can kind of break into it. And that's why that they do juggling. So this way, I think that when they're throwing things up in the air, people can see from a distance that something's happening. Or yeah. as Jim would do, is he would take his wand and bang on the uh, on his table and get attention because there's a loud noise of some sort. The same thing of you with the tambourine or throwing it up in the air that gets uh, attention in both those regards and then can draw the crowd. That's exactly right. And, you know, talking about whacking his wand on the table, you know, he used to buy those store-bought wands, particularly at Tannins, which used to be on Broadway in yeah. New York. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were like $12 a piece. And at $12 a whack, that got really expensive because he kept breaking them. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> he probably realized before long he didn't need to have a special wand, just a stick would do. <laughs> well, that that what happened is that when we were in uh, Seattle, uh, we were talking with a guy – after a show, and he said, you know, he said, you should check out some warehouses that sell wood, particularly for boats. And he said, ask them if they have any lignum vitae. You know, he said it comes from Argentina, it comes from other places. And he said, if you get some of that and you have it tooled, you know, have a Laysman tool, mm -hmm. it, he said, you can get the hardest wood in existence, and you can whack the crap out of that wand on the table and it won't break. Hmm. And so that's what we did. Uh, we found a, a warehouse in Seattle, and they happened to have a huge block of this ironwood, lignum vitae, and it was enveloped in wax, and they sold it by the pound. Mm -hmm. and, and I write about this in the book, uh, when Jim held that in his hand, it was so funny. He was like sort of still for a moment. And it was as if there was something magical about this wood. And he said, oh, he said, this is just going to be fantastic. And so I called around different places and I found uh, a company uh, out on, I think it was the Squamish Way or something. And so we took the wood to them and the guy turned the wood, and he was able to get seven wands out of that block of wood. And so there was such a difference in knowing that this wood was not going to break. And what Jim did is that's when he discovered during a rainy season where we had to stay indoors uh, in San Francisco with this wood, that's when he came up with that trick. The with the wand. Merlin's wand? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so using something like Lignum Vitae, the iron By book, the way, I, I kind of maybe spoil something there. When people don't know when to say Merlin's wand, would you explain the effect as far as the vanishing wand? Just explain what that means. Okay, so, so he would hold the wand, you know, on the tips, palms up on the tips of his fingers, and then all of a sudden the wand would disappear and then he would reach into his vest and pull out a little coin purse and then he would pull the wand out of the coin purse. And here's the kicker is the fact that most of the time he worked without sleeves, totally sleeveless. I recall also in the book that when he had the, uh, the tattoos, the the prison tats from from way back uh, when, that he used to wear long sleeve shirts, kind of trying to cover it up. But then after he started rolling up the sleeves to do that particular trick, realized how strong that it was. That, that heck, I'll start working in short sleeves so everybody knows that. And so he kind of went that way. He did. He was embarrassed by those tattoos for a long time. It was actually when he was young, before he spent some time in prison, and uh, he he was quite embarrassed by those for a long time, but then working out on the street, going sleeveless was so extremely powerful 
that it just didn't bother him anymore. Right. Whatever became of the uh, the wands, by the way? Oh, gosh, all kinds of things happened to those. <laughs> we lost one down a city great. A <laughs> uh, uh, couple of them were stolen. Um, I think he gave one away. But here's the here's one thing talking about those wands. One really cool thing is going to Cornwall to St. German's Cornwall when we worked at a festival called the Elephant Fair. Okay. It took place on uh, the grounds of Port Elliot Estate, and the Port Elliot Estate was owned by Lord uh, Peregrine Elliot of uh, Cornwall, and he had. He was kind of like the hippie lord. Mm -hmm. It was a fantastic, fantastic festival, which unfortunately no longer exists. Uh, But we made friends with him and his friend, an author, Hethcote Williams, who lived at the uh, at the mansion with him. And this was a hundred forty four room estate. And the elephant fair, the festival took place on the great lawn in front of the estate. And both Perry, Lord Peregrine, and Hefka, the author, were huge magic buffs. And so they spent a lot of time with, with Jim, uh, and he spent a lot of time with them, showing them different tricks. So when we moved back to North Carolina in 1986, when I was pregnant, uh, we opened up a little club, and we ended up having a magic convention there. And Lord Peregrine flew in to attend the magic convention. Wow. And what he ended up doing is he took a piece of furniture, a chair from his estate that was made out of ironwood. He took the uh, the feet off, the legs off and had them tooled and gave him gave Jim some ironwood wands made out of the chair legs. Wow. That was just a really amazing thing. And so things, different things have happened to those wands. Uh, I think uh, he gave a couple of away, you know, a couple of them away to some of his friends, you know, lost some. I was thinking after his passing that there were at least a few things that were left over. Were you the one responsible for dispersing those and getting rid of his equipment? Of course, you separated, I guess, after his uh, before his passing. But did you? come get back together since he didn't really have any other relatives or oh no we didn't he uh no he he ended up having another partner marianne and and she was the one that was responsible for taking care of everything we split in 1990 Mm -hmm. uh, but we kept in touch and we did a few things together but his partner marianne did handle everything even though we ended up going to the funeral in 2009 in Baden, Switzerland. Now, I know also we were talking about you doing the Wonder Mouse thing, but you also did this little thing as Pinocchio for a while, which I think in yes. the pictures, by the way, the, the book, um, well, I'm going to get into the book here pretty soon about how it was written in the pictures and everything, but the photo of you as Pinocchio just looked to be the cutest thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So tell me something about that and why that didn't continue on. I mean, I understand you, you kind of chafed your... The, your thighs, the top of your legs, as you were kind of squatted down for all day long with that table thing. But um. <laughs> Well, the evolution of that was, um, since it was very difficult to sit down like that, in fact, it was really funny because some of the cleaning women from the Presbyter on the corner of Jackson Square, where I, where I used to set up, they thought I was a midget. So uh, <laughs> it was wonderful. And yeah. and it it was a it was a great thing for me to to learn because um, I did that after I did Mickey the Wonder Mouse, which was all over New York City mm-hmm. when I showed for George the uh, George Price the Mouse Man. Did you make more money actually as Pinocchio than you did pitching the mice? Um, I actually I did. Oh really? And most of it I think was uh because it was so pretty looking, you know mm-hmm. people. Visually, it was very visually pretty. And what was neat is that uh, Jim knew how to sew, use a sewing machine, because Slidini taught him. 
when he used to take uh, lessons from Slidini when he was younger in his 20s, uh, that's when Slidini used to make those um, silk knots, you know, out of the parachute, parachute knot. cloth, right? Mm-hmm. And so Jim would spend time with him, you know, rolling the edges and sewing that they would actually hand sew some of those and sometimes it would machine sew. But Slidini used to tailor all of his own performing outfits. And so he actually taught Jim how to sew. Hmm, interesting. Jim actually made that little Pinocchio outfit for me <laughs> on the sewing machine because <laughs> I didn't sew. <laughs> it was a very a, a very cute thing, and uh, I, I, I as far as the the picture on that, just uh, just trying to give a visual image of just thinking of like a tabletop basically with these little Pinocchio legs that were laid out on the top of this checkerboard tablecloth, and you were kind of sitting on top of that, so it looked like you were the puppet sitting on this thing, basically, but then you were, the tablecloth was covering your legs, obviously, so that's why they thought, I guess you you were a midget uh, when you were sitting on a chair or something, but basically trying to balance that uh, piece of plywood that was underneath that on the top of your thighs over there. I guess when it came time to go to the bathroom, you're thinking, I probably the first day, I didn't think this out too well. I, you know, and that was the whole thing. So I didn't drink any water at all, all day long. <laughs> oh, mercy. In New Orleans, when it's blazing hot, golly. <laughs> well, the really pretty visual thing about yes. it, which there was another tip that, that Jim did, is over my eyelids, I glued a sequin, like a little gold sequin, mm-hmm. over each of my eyelids. And so when the sun would hit it, when I would flutter my eyes, it would sparkle and it would catch people's attention. And that was just one other little trick that Jim knew, theatrically speaking, you know, that how visually pretty it would be, you know, yes. with the sequin cap and then using the sequins on my eyelids and just fluttering it, you know, and then I would talk about stuff and nonsense in a really high voice. And Jim taught me how to make magic hats out of tissue paper and I would fold them where they would end up being like little square and little square packets. Mm-hmm. And then he showed me how to roll up strips of tissue paper that were like about an inch, maybe two inches thick and glue each end together. And I'd roll it in a huge roll and take pipe cleaners. And I would tear off a piece of that tissue paper and wrap it around the pipe cleaner. It looked just like a rose. Sure. And so that's how I made the tips, is I would give the rose out to the little girls, sometimes the little boys, or a magic hat. Mm -hmm. And then I kept my tip bag in the front. You know, it was an old knitting bag with a great big, huge, fake $1 bill so people would know that's where they would put the tip. I think it would be a difficult thing if someone came by one of the local kids and grabbed your money and started to run because you couldn't get up and go after him. It's like, oh, well, there he goes. <laughs> See, and that's the funny thing, because those kids loved me. Uh-huh. So any of the kids who usually created trouble or maybe were little pickpockets or whatever, they loved me. Oh, they loved me. And they would always just come over and ask for a little a uh, little something or just to talk to me. Mm-hmm. Nobody bothered me at all. That's great. Yeah. Now, how long did you do that? Was that just a year or two? Yeah, that was a couple of years when we would go back to New Orleans because what I did was I graduated from sitting down and I got a cart and uh, Jim built a stage on the cart with a canvas background of a Bavarian scene, a Bavarian mm-hmm mountain scene and actually the person who ordered the cart for me was Gottlieb Kogel who owned his magic store up on uh, uptown on first street and Gottlieb Kogel had his magic store in his house on in the New Orleans or uh, New York in New Orleans yeah oh New Orleans okay in New Orleans yes and he ordered the cart for me and allowed me to pay him back when I got the money hmm which was he was so kind to so many magicians and performers. And he went ahead and ordered the card and paid for it. And I was able to pay him back later. Now, back around that time, I was thinking also that um, 
Harry Anderson was working the streets in New Orleans. I know he was a street performer. Did, did you ever run across him? He was actually in San Francisco, and he had already quit by the time we got out to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And he worked the streets in San Francisco, and he was known for doing the uh, giant card, three card money thing. Right. Um, but by that time, I think I think he worked in the seventies there, and I think he had already had started the television show in the eighties. Okay. But he did end up going to New Orleans and opened up a, a magic shop and theater right on Jackson Square in the French Quarter. Mm-hmm. And Katrina came. Well, that was a spade and archer. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Katrina came and that just was a disaster. Yeah. And that's when he decided to move to North Carolina, I think, didn't he? He moved to Asheville. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which is where he retired and, and finally passed. Yeah. So I know that you must have come across certainly just some of the most unusual street performers and people ever. Uh, and I uh, and you write eloquently and beautifully about uh, many of them. And uh, one that really kind of stuck out to me was uh, Rock. It's not Rockerbomb. It wasn't John Rockerbomb. It wasn't that Rock. But uh, no. <laughs> it was uh, a different Rock, and he was an artist. Oh, yes. Noel Rockmore. Uh, he was an artist in the French Quarter. Um, he was actually born and raised in Manhattan and he lived in Manhattan till he was in his, oh, gosh, I guess in his 40s. And he moved down to the French Quarter and he loved painting street performers, musicians, uh all the colorful characters, and he was an absolutely colorful character himself. Mm-hmm. And he was fairly well known in New York and fairly well known, you know, of course, all over. And he had paintings at the Hershey Museum in D.C., uh, in the Delgado Museum in New Orleans, which is now the New Orleans Museum of Art, and the Whitney Museum all over. Um, I think he kind of destroyed his own self. As as many artists do. I've uh, heard that whether it's Van Gogh or whomever, it seems like they've had troubled lives. And uh, that's what they they call on in their inner soul, I guess, whenever that they're actually creating their artwork. And, yeah, it seemed like that he had some demons. Well, the gallery owners in New York got really ticked off at him because every once in a while he'd go in there and he'd get mad and he'd pull some of his paintings off the wall and say, you can't have this. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and then he'd just jump out and run away with his paintings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was and a character. It sounds like he was quite quite a character. And the last time you saw him was when? The last time I saw him was probably 1990. And then I think can't remember. I think he passed away in 1994, mm-hmm. I believe it was. I think it was 1994 or 1996. I'm pretty sure it was 1994. In uh, New Orleans. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes. Um, and so tell me about uh, some of the others. I, I know there were jugglers and street clowns and some people who had the good act and some who didn't and some who I know hung around Jim uh, Cellini and, uh, and, and tried to get some some free tips and some ideas and what they could do then also. So yeah. tell me something about a couple of your good friends or memories of that. Well, uh, Chris the Piss Lynam is still doing uh, clowning, and he lives in London. Chris does a fantastic, very unusual act. Um, so to check him out, you can look him up, Chris Lynam. And then another uh, guy, uh, Sebastiano Lamanto. Mm-hmm. He came to New Orleans. Uh, he, you know, kind of looked around the square, met Jim and decided that, oh, gosh, you know, I want to do something on the street. I want to make a living on the street. And so Jim had told him, you know, he said, try balloons. He said it's the easiest way to get your foot in the door of doing something on the street. And then when you get used to it, if you want to do something else, if you want to get into magic or whatever, he said, I'll teach you. And so that's what Sebastiano did. And the difference is, is because he did not speak, he didn't speak English at all when he came and then he learned. But because he didn't speak English, he used his acting ability to gather a crowd and to do so much miming 
um, that, of course, all the ladies just fell all over themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Say, oh, beautiful lady, you know, have the balloon. And but he was very artistic. And that was the neat thing to actually take the balloon and to create a show out of it. You know, not only with the creation, the balloon creations, but, you know, to do almost like a whole mime, a whole artistic theatrical thing. Mm -hmm. So and he ended up, yes, he wanted to learn magic. And so Jim taught him and he ended up getting a job at the Italian village during the World's Fair in New Orleans. And that led to another gig in South Africa in Durban at another big festival event that went on for like a year, I think it was, and then on and on. And so what we used to do is we all just used to meet every morning at the Alpine restaurant and have breakfast together and just talk, you know, talk about things that were going on or, you know, some of them would talk crap about other people. <laughs> mm -hmm, right. And just tell stories of what they've been doing. Yep. Stories. And, you know, that's where, uh, like, when George Price, the mouse man, came to New Orleans, you know, he usually stayed in New York, but he decided that he wanted to come down to New Orleans and try it out. Well, at that time, he was probably 80 years old. Um, and... He was working out, I think it was working out on bourbon in the spot that usually Jim and I would work. And we saw this big crowd around him. It was right outside of Houlihan's. And we saw this old man in a top hat, you know, in an old timey black suit in a sing song voice, you know, step right up, folks, meet Mickey the Wonder Mouse. Mm hmm. Looked at each other, and I had never seen a pitch man before. I didn't know anything about, you know, pitching, whatever it was. Right. And what I ended up doing is, because I was so enthralled by this little Mickey the Wonder Mouse, I immediately put a dollar in his suitcase and, and got a mouse. And he told me afterwards, he said, well, thanks for shilling for me. And I went, what? <laughs> he said, thought you were shilling for me and I went what's that and he said well when you're a shill he said you're the first one to put the dollar in the hat and that prompts other people to buy it and mm -hmm. I went oh so I didn't know that and so Jim's idea was for me to learn the mouse and learn how to pitch it just in case anything happened to him and I needed to make some money that reminds me one time in New Orleans when I was at a jam auction. And I guess you know what a jam auction is. Yes. Um, and it was the first one I had actually experienced. And I was actually part of the crowd, I guess, when this guy was pitching his knives or whatever that it was. Uh -huh. But I did, I did know one of the magicians who was in the crowd. And I and he was kind of towards the back. And uh -huh. then as the guy said, step closer, let me tell you more about this. Then he started pushing this. And my buddy, who was the magician, said, Help me," he said. Just, just move forward because you're. That's what the jam is. You're trying to jam everybody into closer, so that way everybody else it make more room for more people and everything. And then I talked with the guy afterwards, and he was explaining, "Yeah, that's what's it all about. It's a jam auction where you're jamming them in, and you get behind, you keep pushing them in, pushing them in. It's like, huh? So I learned something there too on the street. Yeah. And that was. And so what I did was uh, when I learned the mouse pitch and I and I practiced. Uh, then when we went back to New York that summer, after having met George down in New Orleans, he had returned to New York, and I ended up being his shill for a few weeks on the streets in New York. And mm -hmm. that way, I, you know, I kept memorizing the pitch and watching him do the moves, you know, use Mickey the Wonder Mouse. And when I did that on my own. Of course, in the book, I talk about it, and it was the, my first time was just a total fiasco. <laughs> right, right. It was, it was really bad. I just messed everything up. I messed all the moves up. I just, I got really embarrassed. You know, guys were just coming from behind me, breathing down my neck, making me really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so what I ended up doing is we went to the Allentown Fair in Pennsylvania, and I rented a booth 
there, which allowed me to pitch the mouse without people surrounding me on all sides. And so I kept doing that and I kept doing that and I worked it for about three or four days and I sold a bunch of mice and I gained confidence and I got the pitch down pat. So when we went back to New York City, it was so much easier for me to do and I could handle, you know, all the hecklers and and Mm -hmm. the guys making faces at me and making me, you know, I could handle all of that. And so that was actually my first time that I ever did anything on the street by myself. Yeah. So it just takes time and effort and flight time, basically. The more you do it, the better you're going to get at it and kind of uh, handling all situations. Right. So I was working one corner and Jim was working the next corner. (laughs) (laughs) That must have been fun. Uh, Yeah. Well, also that when you're talking about when you went to, yeah, to San Francisco or you would go then to New York and uh, New Orleans and kind of bounce around the U.S., at what point did you decide that, okay, we're going to go to a festival and we're going to go overseas or we're going to cross a border? And at that time, was it something in which that you were reimbursed or saying we'll pay your fee to come over here? Because that's got to be a pretty expensive ticket to take your stuff and, and go. Well, what we did is the first time we went, over, uh, we actually went to uh, London and Great Britain first. We had met uh, Bob Reed in New York City. Mm-hmm. And Bob Reed, you know, the. I know Bob. I remember him. Yeah, he was really absolutely loved the cups and balls. He, he loved street performers. Of course, he was uh, best known for his collection of cups and balls art yes. work. Mm-hmm. So we met him in New York City. He was on business. And he said, hey, he said, if you guys get over to London, he said, you stay with me and my wife. And so we thought about it and thought about it. And and we decided that in 1984, we decided, hey, it's time we need to go. And so we flew on the red eye. And at that time, standby, it was only a hundred bucks to fly from New York to London. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that. I, I uh, in 1972 flew round trip from New York to Luxembourg for $182 on Icelandic Airlines. Yeah, I remember that very well. <laughs> we stopped in Reykjavik, which was uh, for like a layover for 24 hours, and that was when uh, Spassky uh, and Fisher were playing the chess match back then the too during that time. Anyhow. But that's, you know, and at the time, too, Virgin Airlines was actually allowing street performers to fly for free as long as they did a show. On on the plane. Plane, yeah. I remember hearing about that, uh, that uh, Sir Richard Branson was encouraging people. So they had guitar players and comedians. I think Pat Hazel was, I think, had told me he had done some comedy on there once. And several people, I guess, have been working. So it was kind of... uh, uh, pay for play, huh? Yes, hmm. yeah. But we just went, we just took the red eye and the standby, you know, and, and we went, we stayed with Bob and his wife. And so we we hit London and we worked, of course, Covent Garden, Yeah. Uh, Camden Lock. What um, was that like the first time? I mean, there are so many other magicians performing there who at the time you probably hadn't seen their style. Did you feel... Or did Jim feel that his style uh, of performing was the same or different, or he was bringing something new to the table? Oh, he definitely brought something new to the table. Pe- people had not seen someone like him before. And the London magicians were great. We used to stop off at Davenport's oftentimes on our mm-hmm. way. And then, of course, Alan Allen uh, would bring a couple of his students who happened to be um Michael Vincent and I'm trying to think the other guy's name, Richard. Uh, gosh, I can't think of his last name right now, but they were like 20. Richard Penner? I, it could be. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. We met uh, Reverend Roger Crossway. Yeah. And they were just wonderful. The London magicians were really good to us. And we tried to work a lot of different spots but unfortunately, in London, they were not the same as they were in New York. So when we worked in the city of London, which was their financial district, yeah, uh, we kept getting kicked out. And then, you know, we'd walk six blocks away and think, oh, that's not their territory anymore and set up again. And then the same Bobby would come walking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> so what did I just tell you guys? <laughs> get out. You know, 
you now, did you could you have purchased a permit in order to have worked at that space, or did they just not allow it at all under any circumstances? They did not. Permits did not exist back then. Okay. There were no there were no permits anywhere anywhere in Europe, anywhere in the United States. Not like it is now. Mm-hmm. And they just did not allow any performers in the city of London. Period. Um, but we worked all kinds of, you know, we worked Leicester Square at night, which was considered kind of a rough area, even though it was a big entertainment area. Yeah. We worked, you know, we worked Bond Street and Portobello Road and hmm. we everywhere we could uh, just to get the experience. Right. And from London, then we took uh, the ferry to Amsterdam and then. From there, we went all over. From other countries where you're performing, I know like in festivals uh, around, and you talk about those then as well, but what what is it like as far as Jim's patter? Because I know that he was funny, and part of the misdirection is what you're saying, and if they don't understand that, then it's going to be difficult. Did he have a translator who was beside him, or did he just do more visual magic or use music or what? Uh, well, that was the funny thing. Like in Amsterdam, most people speak English, so they got everything. That's yeah, a second language there, but some uh, countries may not have been the same back then. Right. So places in France and places in Italy uh, weren't the same. And this is what Jim wanted. He wanted to be able to act out more without having to use so many words. Mm-hmm. And so not speaking the language and then not understanding English forced him to be more creative and, and to be, you know, uh, more mime oriented. Sure. And more exaggerated gestures. And so we had no problem at all, no issue at all. And hmm. he got better and better. And that was the whole thing, uh, in the be- in the beginning to do so many shows, particularly in a place like New York City, even in San Francisco. In San Francisco, we went down on Market Street near the Embarcadero in their financial district, and we were the only ones working there. And then all of a sudden, other performers noticed it, and they started coming down there. But since they had not worked in an environment like that, as opposed to, you know, the the malls on Fisherman's Wharf, right? they couldn't hold the crowds like you normally could. Uh, because these are office workers and people, you know, working in buildings and people in a rush, which is a totally different thing from uh, working in front of tourists who have their time, you know, taking their time. Of all those places that you visited with Jim, and he may have had his favorites as well, but uh, what location did you prefer to want to go back as often as you could? Well, here's the thing. Switzerland was the best money. And the best response, and we love the people there, but we also love the people in Spain. And uh, In Madrid, or whereabouts did you go in Spain? We mostly stayed in the southern part. We went to Barcelona, Mm -hmm. and we worked in Barcelona, and then we traveled south for the winter and stayed in a little uh, place in between um, Marbella, and uh, Tormelinas, and it was called Las Belicias. And it was a suburb of Fungarola on the Costa del Sol. Were you traveling mostly by train back then? Because in the U.S., I know, as you said, you had the step van, and then later the bus, I know. But in going overseas, did, rather than renting a vehicle, just take the trains, I assume? Actually, in Amsterdam, we bought a car. Oh, okay. And some guy told us about this guy who sold VWs, usually camper vans, and he would sell them to tourists who would use them during the summer, and then they'd come back and resell them back to him. But he happened to have a little Volkswagen Scirocco, and we bought it for 500 bucks, and all I had to do was go to the post office and get my plates. (laughs) Yeah. Insurance, no nothing. And so we traveled all over Europe, Use in that Volkswagen Scirocco. And I, sometimes we would take trains, sometimes we would do them, but most of the time we just took the car. 
I can relate to that. Same thing as I mentioned back in 72 when I went with my buddy, Walt Turner, and we were there for two months. And we traveled probably 18,000 miles from <laughs> from Scotland down to into Italy and over to Spain and everywhere. And we bought a little Volkswagen Bug. And we paid 500, and we ended up coming back and selling it for 300. Uh, but uh, and it pretty much fell apart by the time that uh, we, we, we sold it. Yeah. <laughs> Had to have a new muffler while we were on the road, and all kinds of issues, of course, with that. But nevertheless, that, and, and that goes into something when I'm giving kind of the the background of my trip as far as the muffler and all those kinds of things, you give such a description of everything that you had experienced. It's as if that it just happened last week. You had such clarity of mind and such, I mean, I could, I could smell the coffee aroma of the chicory in, in New Orleans and I can smell the sweat, uh, you know, when it's, <laughs> it's hot, the way that you describe these things and then the colors and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ribbons or whatever else that it is that you have such uh, great language that it, it, it sounds and reads almost like fiction because of the attention to such detail that you've got in the book that I just absolutely loved. And that's what I, I really savor as I'm reading this just a little bit at a time rather than trying to sit down and read it all the way through because it's just I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I, I could imagine what that must have been like because I feel you were I was in the situation. So yeah. were you keeping a diary or how did you have such a or do you have this kind of uh, a savant memory or something. <laughs> Actually, I, I kept a lot of journals and, and I wrote very detailed journals. Uh-huh. And I also, uh, not only did I use those, but I had kept a lot of our letters, uh, that people had sent us and that we had, you know, sent them, but they, we had a lot of correspondence. In fact, I even have two letters from Ross Bertram from uh, buying the Ross Bertram cups from him in Canada. Hmm. And uh, I, I took, uh, you know, I took voracious notes in my journals. And I think uh, all the letters brought back lots of memories. Um, I, you know, of course, with the Internet, it's wonderful to be able to Google Maps and make sure, you know, I had the right sections and the right areas. Right. But a lot of it is is mostly from living it, and it's kind of like in your bones, and it's an experience that you don't forget. And you know, when you when you live in a place like the French Quarter, and you work in a place like the French Quarter, you know, when you when you spend so much time in a place like New York City, you know, 14, 15 hours a day on the street. It's it's an experience you never forget. No, I would imagine that you don't. But again, the the flowery language that you're writing in gives such great description, and not just of what you're seeing and hearing, but also what you're feeling. That you're the emotions that you're writing down. That must have been cathartic whenever that you were writing this diary. Not you said you had copious notes you were taking, and so not only of what you were doing, but as you were mentioning the book, when you step off the van and you're kind of looking out into whether it's the ocean or up the sky or different kinds of things and thoughts you're having as if that you are just, you must have put these all down just in feeling good about kind of releasing them to the world once that they're written and then never thinking you were going to put this into a book, I'm sure. No, I had not. And, uh, but I remember when the time that Jim and I spent together, he always said, save everything. Mm -hmm. And I did, and I'm really glad I did. You gave a lot of advice, it sounds like, to a lot of people that was uh, really, really good advice. Yes. <laughs> sounds like that uh, being a man who actually was from the school of hard knocks, quite literally, and working the streets, that he had the street smarts that yes. uh, that everybody would look to him to listen to his advice. Yes, yes. And and that's the difference. And, and above all, I think, is that his love for magic was undeniable. You know, that was his first true love, wasn't it? Yes, his first true love, and and it saved him as a kid, you know, and it saved him growing up. And I think meeting Slidini and taking lessons from him, uh, from the master, mm -hmm. Tino Marucci, saved his life and steered him in a direction that maybe he may not have headed toward. And so... His love for magic was undeniable, you know, even to the point where I remember him talking about when he learned how to uh, palm silver dollars, mm 
Mm-hmm. He will put his hands in buckets of cold water and learn how to palm the coins with his hands frozen in cold water. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Knowing that perhaps he may be working the streets sometimes when it's so cold, he's going to have to have that skill. I have no idea, but he just said he <laughs> that so he would get really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, he, you know, he had all kinds of little tricks. You know, sometimes he would take a fingernail polish and put it around the edges of coins if he wanted to dull the sound. Oh, that's smart. Mm-hmm. Right. Just, you know, all different kinds of little tips like that. That. Now, as you were both growing together and getting older and traveling different places and together, that it seems natural that uh, you would get pregnant and have a child. And so uh, that's, you discuss that a little bit then in the book uh, then as well. Yes, just just a little bit. And, yeah. and that was sort of like the turning point for us as far as uh, one thing I can say about Jim is he he never said anything else except for the fact that he always wanted to work on the streets. He wasn't really interested in much of anything else. Even working festivals, we had the opportunity of um, when Lord Peregrine, when we worked at the Elephant Fair, we weren't hired. Uh, we just showed up and started working the festival grounds. Um, this was Chris the Piss, the, the clown that we had met. He mm-hmm. actually had a gig there. He told us about it. You know, we met him there. He introduced us to Hefcut Williams, the author, and then Hefcut introduced us to Perry. And so we never really, you know, we went up to the Edinburgh Festival and we worked all over, but never were really hired for it. Perry had told us, he said, I'll hire you for next year and I'll get you into the Glastonbury Fair as well. Well, Jim decided that last minute he didn't want to do that. And so his thing was, is he just wanted to be totally free to be able to choose where he wanted to go, when he wanted to go, without being beholden to anyone. And not having a responsibility necessarily show up at a certain place at a certain time. It's like, if I'm there, I'm fine. If I'm not, fine. Exactly. Is that one of the reasons that he didn't work conventions? Because as well known as he was and highly respected among magicians, I don't remember him attending magic conventions, or at least any that I had to been. Uh, probably. And I think over in Europe, you know, since he ended up moving with Mar- Mariana Swiss and since they ended up moving to Baden, Switzerland, I think he did some conventions there. And, of course, he ended up doing lectures particularly mm-hmm. when he fell sick and he literally could not work the street anymore because of the heaviness of the bags and carrying the tables was just too much for his uh, back. He had a terrible sciatica problem, sciatica nerve. I problem. could imagine after <laughs> carrying yeah. that uh, table around all over the place and just a little bag full of stuff that, uh, yeah, yeah, and being on his feet so many hours a day, yes, it'd be yeah. tough. It is, and, and picture this. I used to carry the doctor's bag, an old doctor's bag, full of his, his full set of linking rings. Yeah. <laughs> I used to drag that along, and, you know, then I had a big shoulder bag, and he would dump all the change. I'd heard before a suggestion that one of the street magicians had said to use like a fishing net, basically, so that way people couldn't give coins because it'd fall through, and that way it encouraged people to give bills. I thought, that's a smart idea. <laughs> we, you know, which is true, but, you know, what we used to do in New York is uh, whatever change we got when we ate at the Greek diner, uh, we would eat their breakfast, lunch, sometimes dinner because it was cheap and good food. uh uh-huh. And I would roll up all my coins in in the little coin wrappers. Sure. And they would take all the coins and give me bills. And so that was our little ritual there. Huh. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. That makes sense then, too. Yeah. Well, it was, again, just a, a delightful book and a, a very good read and one that I uh, certainly recommend for others. And for people who want to buy that, it's available through Amazon and through your website. Or how would they get in touch with you or get a copy of that? Well, right now, uh, I offer it on my website through PayPal, but it's uh, for U.S. only, shipping only, and, mm-hmm. and comes directly to me. And if you want to have the, the book autographed, I can do that. 
Um, it will be, it's already been sold out on eBay and Amazon, but it will be back up for sale probably in the next two or three weeks. On eBay, there will be some international shipping uh, available from vendors mm-hmm. at, a, at a better price than I can actually give them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's... Uh, hey, what's the website? Where is your website where they can order that? The website is noordinarymagic.com. So it's, it's the, the title of the book, basically. It's the title of the book, noordinarymagic.com. Okay. And if they want to have it signed, then just to make a request there whenever they're purchasing that. Yes, there should be a, a an area on the, the invoice from PayPal that allows you to put in some um, extra directions or whatever you want so people can do that. Or they can email me directly if they want to, which is emcfalls at noordinarymagic.com. And that's on the website as well. Great. Okay. Just a couple of last things and then we'll uh, wrap this up. And what are some of your, or perhaps the one best memory of where you've been or your time with Jim or something that he had done or influenced or just best memory? Best memory. (laughs) I think my best memories were when we got together and talked with other performers. Mm-hmm. And but one of my best memories really for me was being in St. Germans Cornwall at Port Elliot Port Elliot Estate. Cuz it was the most beautiful and magical place I had ever been to in such a long time. And the people were fantastic. And I was able to spend some time with Hethcote Williams, who, who was an author, a very prolific author, playwright, actor, and to be able to talk with him for hours about a subject that I loved, which was writing, mm-hmm. uh, was wonderful for me. As far as the magical, there were some shows that Jim did at the Theater Spectacle in Zurich, Switzerland, that were so powerful and so incredible that even I was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and you thought you'd seen everything he had done, but until then, huh? And that, that was the thing with him. You know, he was so good with what he did, technically speaking, that when he was on, meaning when he was really on and he was just the consummate actor right. and the consummate magician, it was an incredible sight to see. And I think what it is, is it's, it's the reaction of people because they're all together seeing this wonderful magic and experiencing it with each other and looking, strangers looking at each other and appreciating what they're seeing. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like this group experience that they'll never have again. That's a good point where they congregate for one point in time where they've never been before nor will again and seeing yeah. something. I think that's what, is what art is all about. It is. And then, of course, that the scene that I write about in uh, San Francisco with the surgeon um, who wanted the magic wand to heal him, that was a very, very powerful moment that I will never, ever forget. Mm-hmm. There are some people that um, have a different belief system in what that they they see and they experience than what yes. you're trying to entertain them. And some people take that a little bit differently in different yes. cultures in the world. Yes. Yeah. The last thing is because my podcast is called the Magic Word Podcast, I always like to close with asking my guests of what is your word or phrase? What is your philosophy of life that you live by nowadays? <laughs> That I live on. <laughs> yeah, what mean when you wake up in the morning? What uh, encourages you to keep going throughout the day? Not necessarily a word, but it could be a phrase or just a philosophy. Peace and serenity. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's so funny that you asked that because a few years back, probably about five or six years ago, there was a little ramshackle Buddhist temple in Bolivia, North Carolina, near the coast. And I went there and visited with a friend of mine. And we had a two-hour lesson in Buddhism from the Mm -hmm. abbot. There were actually only two monks there, and one was an abbot. And throughout this whole entire lesson, you know, I loved learning about Buddhism. But the one takeaway that I had from him, which I remember to this day, and I actually do it, he looked at us and he said, 
in the morning when you face the sun. He said, take your right hand and place it in the palm of your left and say, I am very grateful. Hmm. And I have remembered that and I still do that every morning to this day. I am very grateful. I love that. That's great. Well, I'm going to close with that. That is uh, a good way for us to uh, to leave. And again, I want to uh, recommend this book, which is, again, called No Ordinary Magic by Eileen McFalls. And it's uh, beautifully written and has some very nice uh, photos, color photos, uh, it, it tipped in the middle of the book. And as well, quite a few. And I think you guys will enjoy this on so many different levels. Thank you, Eileen, for, for writing it. And thank you also for joining me here on the podcast today. And thank you for having me, Scott. I am very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to finish. I am grateful for having you as, as a new friend here now, too. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you. So for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Eileen McFalls. This is Scotty Out. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so very much. I appreciate that, Eileen, of you joining us this week and telling us about your new book. And I wish you every bit of success. I, I do want to emphasize again just how delightful this book is as far as the feelings that you get whenever that you're reading this, the way that she describes things in such intricate detail. Again, it just seems like it happened yesterday. It's just so fresh, the way that she explains this and the flowery, flowery, fl boy, flowery, language that she uses that it seems to bring it all alive. Just a lot of fun and a good read. So uh, please check that out and go to her website and uh, order your copy then today. Or you can perhaps win a copy. All you have to do is to go to themagicwordpodcast.com for this episode, number 587. And there you will see a link that you can fill out. Actually, it's a little form. You put in your name, your email address, and then you will be entered into the contest. And two names will be randomly selected and if you are a winner and reside in the United States the book will be shipped to you free uh, compliments of Eileen McFalls if you live outside of the uh, US then she'll calculate what the postage is going to be for foreign shipping and if you agree then to pay that shipping she'll send that along so we'll notify you what that is and if you agree fine if you don't then we will draw a second random winner and then uh, go from there so you kind of understand how that works again if you'll just go to the magic word podcast for this episode number 587 and then click on the tab there that says or not the tab but rather fill out the form with your name and email address it's all you have to do very easy to do well that's enough here for this week. We've got a lot going on. This uh, today, by the way, is being released on Thanksgiving uh, in the United States, at least Thanksgiving here in the U.S. And so I wish everyone a uh, happy and most wonderful Thanksgiving. And some of you may be joining with families and others may not. So wherever you are and however you celebrate, I hope that you have a, a very enjoyable time. And so until next week, stay well, get booked. And remember, as you greet the day, just say to yourself, I am grateful. This is Scotty out. Bye.